amen? amen? That was beautiful prayer time, and that was kind of simple. And another amen? All right, now look, look, who's going to do that Monday morning? Awesome. Okay, listen, guys, but before we keep going on with this conference, we talk about God is this, God is that, God is the other thing, and he's all this great stuff. I think it's really super important to establish that God is real. Can I hear an amen? Look, I, I, I think we tend to get kind of bored of our faith. We tend to kind of take it for granted, you know, for, for two reasons. One is that we get bored of everything that we're used to. That's the truth. Like, we, we have tons of things around us in our lives that should amaze us and freak us out. Like, it should amaze me that I flew here from Colorado two days ago on a plane. But you know what I'm thinking the whole flight? Why does it take so long to get there? Dude, a hundred years ago, it took like six months to get here from Colorado, and people would die on the way. But we take all these things for granted. We get used to all sorts of stuff and take it for granted. When, when I was a kid, you wanted to talk on a phone in your car, you had to be the president, okay? Now I have access to all the information and history in the palm of my hand. My voice goes around the moon and back down to your phone. But if it takes too long to do that, I get impatient. We get, thank you for that one laugh over there. We get, <laughs> we get used to everything. We do this with each other. Kids, my teenagers, you do this with your parents. You barely see a human being in your mom sometimes. Like, dude, mom, she's like a fish. You can poke her in the eye. She won't even feel it. She's not a human. She's not a woman. She's a mom. <laughs> takes you till you're about 20, 25 to take a step back. Look at this person. Be like, whoa, mom. Ow. Hey, she's a person. <laughs> Married couples do this with each other. You could be so close to your spouse, you feel alone. You see right past them. See, reverence is when you step back. You look at the reality in front of you and you say, whoa. Can I hear what? That was really good. See, but we lose our woe for God because we're used to him. And you know why else? Because we, we kind of treat him like he's not fully real. See, a lot of people think that faith is a purely personal matter. That morals, that spiritual things, that the meaning of life, that all this stuff is things that people make up for themselves. That's called relativism. Can you say that word? Relativism. Good. Relativism is the philosophy that there's no truth outside of you, but you make up your own truth. This is the truth for me. You have a truth for you. I can't impose my truth on you and your truth. Now, most people are not relativists when it comes to things like math. No one says two plus two is five for me. Don't impose your four on my five, you closed-minded Catholic. <laughs> but, but most people are, are relativists when it comes to everything else. Who is God? How, hey, what's, what's, what, you know, how to make a moral decision, all this kind of stuff. Why? Because most people think that if you dare to assert the truth, like two plus two is four, Jesus is God, heaven is real, there is a meaning to life, I actually know it. People think if you assert those things... That makes you kind of closed-minded and hard-hearted and intolerant. Really? Is that what it does to us? Dude, look, Mother Teresa disagreed with Hindus. She thought they were wrong about the divinity of Jesus. She would never say, I have my truth, they have their truth. She, said, she would say they're wrong. Are we going to see a, a video come out of her, like in a back slum of Calcutta, kneeing a Hindu in the face? Except Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you'll get your rice. No. You see, most of us learn to disagree and respect people in kindergarten when you were disagreeing about a block and you learn not to hit someone in the head with the block you're fighting over. It's not that complex. Mother Teresa of Calcutta disagreed with gay marriage. She disagreed with the gay lifestyle. Oh, she must have been a bigot and a hater. Really? Mother Teresa started the first AIDS hospice in New York City. This is back in the 80s when, when people thought by sneezing you might contract AIDS. All right, so she risked her life to serve these people. Was she a hater because she disagreed with their moral decisions? Can I hear a no nice and loud? It's absolutely okay to say there's a truth, to say there are moral guidelines, to say that there's a truth about God, how we're supposed to live. And it doesn't mean you hate people you disagree with. Duh! But we get bored of faith because we take it for granted. 
or because we think it's purely personal. And when you have a faith that's purely personal, a faith that's relativist, a faith where you think this is what works for you, and by the way, 93% of teenagers said they don't believe in absolute truth. If that's where you're coming from with your faith, then you have this faith where you say, this is the God that works for me. And the sixth and ninth commandments, I'm going to chuck those out. They're a little difficult. And I'm going to carve a smiley here. And here's the, here's the God I've made for myself. I'll put this in an altar and worship it. What's the Bible call that? Idolatry. Oh, you can call it Catholic all you want. But if it's faith on your terms, it's idolatry. And if your God lets you do whatever you want, your God is probably you. Oh, snap. <laughs> I don't like the host anymore. <laughs> Guys, let's take a step back. Let's look at some stuff you already know. Hmm? Let's look at this basic heart and core and center of our faith like it's really real because it is, and let's look at it like we haven't heard it a million times before, we're not used to it, and let's look at it and say, whoa. Give me another one. Good, because we should be, whoa, we should be amazed, we should be freaked out about the fact, about the reality that there is a God. And I said, reality, fact that there's a God, because there is one. Atheism is like a flea that does not believe in the dog. I don't see a dog, that's because you're a flea, maybe. One of Einstein's assistants said that saying all this could come about from a random series of explosions is like saying an unabridged dictionary could come from a print shop explosion. <laughs> Whoa, paper, ink, bindings. Hey, dictionary. No way. I don't think so. Guys, this didn't just come from nowhere. The Big Bang didn't just come from nowhere. We used to think the universe was expanding through space and time. We know it's not now. And if you're like a physics geek, you'll know why too. Hmm? We know it's not because the, check this, this is crazy. The universe is not expanding through space and time because it contains space and time. What? So what's out there, outside the universe? Listen, there's no there because there's not even space. What was happening for all that time before the Big Bang happened? There was no time. What? Okay, I can believe that, but, but you want me to believe that a Big Bang could somehow Big Bang itself? <laughs> All by itself. And 13.7 billion years later, rational creatures are walking around drinking Starbucks, just kind of <laughs> Starbucks, just kind of happened. <laughs> I was debating an atheist online. He's like, I get attacked by atheist trolls a lot. So like, Chris, you're saying there's a, there's, there's a God. That's as stupid as a kid coming down on a Christmas morning seeing presents under his tree and saying, oh, look, presents. There must be a Santa. I said, really? Because, first of all, there is a Santa. And second of all, <laughs> I mean, how else to get those presents? I'm like, I'm like, all right, point well taken. But, but really, because you go, you know, you saying there's no God, it's like a kid coming down on Christmas morning, seeing presents under his tree and saying, oh, look, presents. They must have exploded themselves here. <laughs> okay, which kid is stupider? Is that even a word, stupider? <laughs> like someone's like, I'm from stupider Florida. Jupiter, Florida, wait, wait same thing? That's all good, no. <laughs> <laughs> There is a God, and we can know that through reason. Atheists try to pretend it's science against religion, and the more we learn about science, the more it crowds out religion. Guys, the Catholic Church was the main organization funding science for about a thousand years. We're not anti-science. The fathers of many sciences are Catholic priests and monks. That's cool. Because we see the beauty of creation, we realize its significance because it's made by God, so we want to study it. Kind of came up with a lot of this stuff. You're welcome, world. But I'll tell you what, it's not science against religion, it's a weak philosophy called materialism against metaphysics, materialism against religion. This idea that the material world is sufficient for explaining itself and how it got here all by itself and created itself. That's ridiculous. Everything in the material world was created by something else. Everything. Chris, where'd your microphone come from? 
nowhere. It was always here. No. It was made by something else. The universe itself, stay with me, is a material something. It had to be made by something that preceded the material universe. Immaterial things like 2 plus 2 is 4, a concept, does not have to be made by something. So the universe is a material something made by something that has the power to make a universe. We can maybe call that something what? God. Now, I don't know why there's a God. I don't. But I do know that because there's something, there's a starting point that didn't have to be started by something else. There's God. I know, I know if there's a painting on a wall, there's a what? An artist, right? Someone said God. There's a couple steps between the painting and God. It's all good. I want to buy that painting. If I hold a book in my hand, I can know there is a what? An author. I'm not going to say, I can't see J.R.R. Tolkien, therefore he does not exist. I just know I have this awesome book. And, and <laughs> all shall love me and despair. So, um... And if I look at the book of the universe, I can know there's what? God. I think we got the first generation in history with so many people who say, God, if you're really there, why don't you reveal yourself to us? And God is looking down from heaven, of course, and saying, did you not notice everything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hold on. Evolution disproves God, right? Give me a break. What's cooler? A God who could say, hey... Here's a lump of clay, pfft, here's a rhino. Or a God who could say, hey, watch what this ball of gas does. Whew, just give it time. You know, I haven't been able to do anything life-giving with my balls of gas ever. <laughs> we should be amazed and freaked out about the fact that there's a God. Can I hear a whoa? whoa. All right, here's what else should amaze us and freak us out. That this God entered the bubble of space and time with us. He loved us so much, he became one of us, but we're used to him. We're almost bored of him. He's so cute. He's a guy that plays sports with little kids, and he always wins because he's 33 and he's God. <laughs> we lose our woe factor with all these images of God that we have. He's a hippie, right? I was watching Occupy Wall Street. He was there. Okay, listen. He loved nature, but he was not a hippie. Can I hear an amen? Yeah, yeah but if you were around, he'd smoke pot because he invented it, right? Okay, listen. He also invented lava. Does he want you to put it in a brownie? <laughs> Just saying. I know Jesus, man. I'm used to him. Been around him my whole life. Grew up with him. He's that really happy guy, right? Every time the church has a challenging teaching on anything, the whole world responds to shock. It's like, come on, what would Jesus do? Oh, did he just walk around all day handing out God-sized warm fuzzies? Is that what he does? Was his whole mission to come and make us feel good about ourselves right where we are? No. He challenges us. When you get close to him, when you do Lexio Divina, which is what we did when we read the Bible this morning and thought about it, he will make you very uncomfortable. Is it because he's a hater? No, it's because he loves you more than anybody else. Sometimes that means he's going to make you more uncomfortable than anybody else. We get all these images of Jesus in our heads. A lot of guys have this one in their heads. A very overly feminized, gentle Lord who never challenged anyone. Who's not, not, he doesn't look manly strength. Listen, guys. Girls outnumber you every Sunday at church by 25%. Sometimes that's because you have an image of Jesus you can't relate with i got to clarify this. Even though God has obviously feminine characteristics, otherwise there would be no such thing as female. He used himself as the archetype for all that he created. Yet Jesus was a first century carpenter with dirt under his fingernails, calluses under his hands. He lifted stuff by hand. He had big muscles. He drove like a Ford F-250 with four wheels in the back. <laughs> Just like everybody from Tampa. Yes. <laughs> All these images of Jesus, we just make us easy, easy to write off. Or this one, Plasti Lord, the plastic Messiah. Hmm? I was a youth minister in the East LA area for four and a half years. There's a kid in my confirmation class who's in jail right now for a drive by shooting. True story. Someone had done a drive by in his mom's car from their bicycle. You don't need a license to do a drive by. Ding, ding. Pfft. 
him and his friends went out and found and killed this kid. There was another confirmation class near mine. So many gangsters in it, there was a drive-by on the class. Sick and wrong. You know what every gangster in East L.A. had dangling from the car windows they did drive-bys from? Plastic Jesus. And that's an extreme example of something you do. Something I've done. When you think you can, I don't know, act one way at a party on Saturday night, go to mass Sunday morning, sleep with your girlfriend Sunday night, act like a jerk on the football field the next day, you know, talk about that girl in the locker room the next day. All, it all fits together with youth retreat because he's just plastic. He's part of my culture, part of my history. Right? If you're Mexican, you've, you've been Catholic since Our Lady of Guadalupe. I've, I've, woo! I've heard the saying, I've heard the saying, you don't have to believe in God if you're Mexican, but you have to believe in Our Lady of Guadalupe. If you're Irish Catholic, you've been Catholic since St. Patrick. But I'll tell you what, the day, the be- there's a beautiful thing there, but the danger is if we start treating Jesus like he's just part of our past, part of our history, but not really God in the flesh. Maybe this is the Jesus you get in your head sometimes. A great teacher, a prophet, a wise man. That doesn't work either. And when non-Christians say that, I appreciate it because they're saying, I don't agree with you, but I won't disrespect your Lord. Thank you. But here's why it doesn't work. What if I grabbed this microphone last night after I was introduced and I said, listen, I want to welcome you guys to the most important two and a half days of your life. And you're about to hear the most important message you will ever hear. Ready? Here it is. Me? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you'll never die. And one last thing, this is really important. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have life in you. God bless. Would you look back and say, Chris, he was a, uh, a prophet, a wise man, a great teacher. No, what would you say? He was out of his mind. He was either who he said he was or he had the worst ego in all of human history. And from the very beginning, the early Christians worshipped this man as God in the flesh. Now... This is crazy. This is stuff that we we get used to, but should scandalize us and freak us out. When St. Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, that was a crazy thing to say. And when Jesus did things that implied his divinity, like saying, I forgive you, that was crazy. People freaked out about that. Why? Oh, you're used to it. You don't even get why. We don't even get why until we think about it for a minute. We're so used to it. Okay, let me tell you why. What if I slapped you, someone walked into the room, went up to me and said, Chris, I forgive you. She'd be like, he slapped at me. He treated sins like they personally offended him. And when people freaked out, he said, no, 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 to prove to you I have the power to forgive sins, he pointed to a paralyzed man, you, get up and walk. The guy got up and walked, and then everybody pooped themselves right there. And then believed. That's what it says in the Bible. (laughs) Guys, this is God in the flesh. How do we know? How do we know this is real? I'll tell you how. He rose from the dead. You rise from the dead, I will believe anything you have to say. But how do we know he really rose? You just believe. No. Look, there's, there's an aspect of just believe. Don't get me wrong. You see... Belief is not all about your brain. If it were a topic to learn, it would be all about your brain. But faith is a relationship you enter. It's kind of like marriage. Yeah, you got to know certain things about the person you're going to marry. You better have good reasons behind the person you ask to marry you. But does learning the facts about that person equal marriage? No. It leads you to the threshold. And eventually, you got to man up, and the will has to move where your brain can't move by itself. And you say, hey, I just got $2,000 pre-approved on credit. Here's a ring. Will you marry me? (laughs) (laughs) That's faith. 
it better make sense to you. You better have good reasons. Here's the reasons. But you know what? Eventually, God, I give myself to what you have revealed. But how do we know this makes sense? Dr. Simon Greenleaf was a Harvard law professor. He wanted to disprove Christianity. He said everything these crazy Christians believe hinges on the fact that they think Jesus Christ rose from the dead that would never even hold up in court. So he starts writing a book about it. Before he finished the book, he became a Christian. Why? He said, you know, wow. What puts someone away in court for a crime is an eyewitness. What if you have a bunch of eyewitnesses? Jail. What if every eyewitness is willing to die for what they saw? He's still going to jail. That's what you got with the rising of Jesus Christ from the dead. Not just people dying for a belief system, but dying based on something they saw. Did you really see him rise? I did. Did you really see it? I did. Did you really see it? I did. St. Peter was crucified. He said, I'm not worthy to die like the Lord. Crucify me upside down. St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. All he had to say was, stop. I made it up. Give me a paper and pen. I'll write a new book called Da Vinci Code. But he didn't. Why? Let this sink in for a minute, my friends. Because all of this is actually real. There is a God. And that God entered Space and time, looking for you. That's real. That's what the story of your life is about. It's not some story written by a divorce. It's not a story written by cancer. It's not a story written by some, some bad person did to you. It's not a story written by your weakness and sin. This is all about the love of Almighty God for you. A God who thought you were worth entering space and time for. I'm going to tell you guys about the worst 20 minutes of my life. Well, you guys could start setting up for Mass right now if you want. The altar. I had the worst 20 minutes of my life. I lost my, uh, my son, Joey, for 20 minutes. We were camping in the woods, and he ran off after some family thinking it was us. He was, he was four at the time. Let me show you a picture of my Joe when he's four. Oh, whatever. That's not Joey. But, uh. <laughs> <coughs> and we were in the Rocky Mountains. It was terrifying. It's, it's the worst feeling ever to be a parent and lose, and lose a kid. And we're screaming his name, and he's sitting down among these big trees, and he, he wouldn't respond to us. And uh, after 15 minutes of that misery, I thought, he, he must have drowned. There's a pond where we're camping, so I ran to this pond, and I'm, I'm knee-deep in this water. And this prayer, as, as I'm in this pond looking for his body, I thought, any minute I'm going to see it floating here. This prayer just exploded from my heart. So God, thank you for loving me. Thank, thank you for the life you've given me. You've given me such a great life. You've given me so many blessings. You've done so much good for me. I want you to take it all back right now and give me my son. And I meant that prayer and it scared me. It's because it was bigger than my own heart. It was a little sharing in the heart of the Father. Thank God we found Joey and God didn't kill me. But he showed me the smallest glimpse of his love for you. See, this isn't some make-believe story, guys. This is as real as two plus two is four, as real as the ground under your feet. That when you and me wander into the forest of sin, God isn't looking down from heaven saying, whatever. He's saying, take everything. Take my life. I'll be your food in the Eucharist. I'll be waiting for you in confession. I just want my son back. I just want my daughter. I just want him to come home. My brothers and sisters, the 
This is real. And this is what makes life good. And this is what makes life the most beautiful story ever told.